Uh, open your Bibles, get ready to turn to a few pages, and uh, let's look through Scripture on the topic of grace today. Uh, we have as a, um, been going through, <clears throat> last couple of months we talked about family. As family is talked about through the scriptures and maybe a different viewpoint on you know, understanding the church as a family based on the way they understood family back in their culture. And we're going to do the same thing this month and next month on grace and trying to define grace and understand what grace is all about. Uh, and make sure that we have a better understanding of what we're, we're dealing with when it comes to grace. <clears throat> grace is one of those topics that I, I think for many, many years was, was supposedly not talked about enough. At least that's the accusation that you hear the younger generation making against the older generation within the church. I'm not sure that that's a true assessment but it is what is often talked about and, and accused. But even with those, with this younger generation that tends to talk about grace a lot, I don't know that they talk about grace properly. I don't know that there is a good definition of grace that is used and a thorough enough understanding of what grace is and how it should affect us as people. And part of the reason for that is that grace just a difficult word to define. We like to have everything tied up with nice little bows in the way that we understand things, and sometimes words are bigger than we give them credit for. Uh, when you get into studying languages, it's a thing called semantic range, meaning all of the different possible ways that this word is used in context in order to give a broad-based understanding of how the word is used. And I don't know that we often use that concept or really try to explore what the semantic range of charis is in Greek or grace and trying to understand what the Bible talks about with this topic. So let's uh, go ahead and uh, just kind of, you know, just, just kind of lay it out on the table. It's kind of a hard word to define, and, and a lot of attempts have been made over the years, like unmerited favor. That's probably the one most of us grew up with, right? Raise your hand. If, that, if I were to say, to give me a definition of grace, you would have said unmerited favor. Like that, that's, that, we were just brought up to have that automatic explanation. What's interesting is through the years when I've asked people, well, then what's unmerited favor? They say, it's grace. Like, they, they, they just explain each other, and I'm not sure that's really the way definitions work. I do think unmerited favor is an excellent definition, just so you know. But I don't know that it is a well-understood definition. And so while, while I like the words, I don't know that it is necessarily the right words that we should be using. Uh, that, I'll be honest, I think this might be an old version of this sermon that I typed up two weeks ago because I thought I was going to deliver this sermon last week and ended up switching sermons. And then uh, let me go through here and make sure that, um, oh no, this is good. Okay, so uh, just making sure. I, didn't, I thought I took this slide out because um, it seemed negative to me and I don't want to be negative starting off this particular sermon. Uh, so a lot of people have used the idea of giving good that's not deserved, and we're going to talk about that more in a moment, or avoiding the bad that is deserved, and again, we'll talk about that one more in just a moment. A kind-hearted disposition. Uh, there is a sense in which somebody who shows grace is just showing a, a kind-hearted attitude towards someone, and I do think that there is a sense in which that, the word is used in that way through Scripture. God's benevolence, that is most definitely the way this word is used as you go through Scripture and you look at it from a cultural standpoint. And we're going to talk about that one more next month uh, because I think that has a lot to do with the way that we apply grace and learn from God's grace and our, what our response to grace should be. Some just have just basically said grace is love. And while... There's a lot of relationship between those two. I don't know that they are necessarily the same thing. And there is some truth in all of these definitions, but I think all of them standing alone are insufficient for trying to understand what the Bible talks about when it mentions the word grace, as Drake read it earlier in Ephesians chapter 2. Well, what another attempt that has been used through the years is to 
say the difference between grace and mercy. And the way that that is typically said is that mercy is not giving someone something bad they do deserve. You show mercy to them by not giving them that bad thing. And grace is correlated to that, but not the same thing, because it is giving them something good they don't deserve. And the way that's often used, uh, just for an illust illustration of it, a child who, who has done some bad thing, let's say they have uh, told a lie. Well, me deciding, we, we've recognized that they've told a lie. The guilt is there. But me deciding to not punish them, that's showing mercy. Me deciding instead to bring them up next to me on the couch and read them a book and spend time with them, that is showing grace. One is not giving them the bad they, they do deserve, and the other one is giving them something good they don't deserve because of their behavior. Now, I understand the reason why we often use these two definitions and separate them and try to make some sort of uh, categories or, or definitions that are opposed to each other because the Bible often talks about grace and mercy to you. Well, since it uses both terms, they must mean something different. And so we've got to give them distinctive definition in order to try to make sense of some of those passages where it's used in the same place. The problem is, I don't know that this is a distinction that the Bible makes. I don't know that the Bible really draws a line between these two terms and consistently uses grace to speak of receiving good you don't deserve and speaks of mercy as avoiding the bad you do deserve. And one of the easiest ways to see that is to look through the Bible and see how often Grace is attached to salvation. Here's why I say that. Salvation is a mercy issue according to those definitions. Salvation is being rescued from bad. So if I talk about being saved, you are saved from something, and what you are saved from is a bad thing. If I rescue my child or save my child from drowning in the pool, what I have done is I have pulled them out of the pool, out of the water, so that they don't die, they don't drown. That is salvation. That is a mercy thing, not a grace thing. And that's where I think sometimes we often struggle a little bit with some of these definitions because Grace is used in a somewhat interchangeable way with other concepts. There's also the sense in which sometimes grace just has nothing to do with salvation. Turn with me over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It's a well-known passage of Scripture where Paul has prayed for rescuing. But he's not talking about rescuing from sin. In this passage, he's talking about being rescued from some sort of ailment or affliction that he is dealing with. So he says there, back in verse, the, halfway through verse 7, Therefore, so that I would not exalt myself, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to torment me, so that I would not exalt myself. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it would leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is perfected in weakness. You try to force this understanding of mercy versus grace into that passage of Scripture, and you go, it becomes more confusing, to be honest. My grace is sufficient for you. My, my gift that you don't deserve is sufficient for you. What does that have to do with him being rescued from some sort of affliction? I, I don't know. I don't know that that definition helps in this regard. And yes, we can force an understanding of, well, he, God is saying the salvation you've experienced is good enough, quit asking for more. But I, I don't know that that's the point here. And so I think we need to be careful about this. The best way that I can maybe draw a distinction that, again, I'm not sure is necessarily consistent through Scripture, but I think it is more consistent 
is this. Mercy is an act of the will, whereas grace is an attitude or disposition. So if I extend mercy to, to Cheyenne, because Cheyenne has been ugly to me and said some mean thing to me, and I've decided that I'm going to be forgiving and extend mercy to her and not try to get her back. That, that's an act or a choice that I'm making towards Cheyenne. Grace towards Cheyenne would be an overall general attitude in which I like Cheyenne. I think she's a lovely person, and I'm going to treat her with a certain, uh, certain way because I, I have grace toward Cheyenne. Is that true? Is that good? Okay. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's what we're... I, I think there's a distinction more in the, the concept of verse, a choice or an act versus a disposition that leads to those choices and acts. So if you look through Scripture, what you have is God has grace toward us. Or if you look at this from an Old Testament viewpoint, he has loving kindness. Loving kindness. That is the way God the way God, his disposition toward his creation, toward his people. He displays loving kindness. Mercy is the act God shows toward us when he decides to forgive us. We don't deserve his forgiveness, but he offers forgiveness because of his mercy. And love, which is also related to these two terms, is the foundation for both. God has grace, and God shows mercy because God loves. And all three of those work together to display for us that he is our benefactor, which is what we'll talk about next month, and that he is our father and our king, which is what we'll talk about some this evening as we continue this lesson. But turn with me to a series of Scripture that I think are important, and the reason I think it's important is because as you look, as we go through these quickly, you're going to find that the same idea is expressed over and over and over again throughout all of the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 34, and starting in verse 6, says here halfway through, the Lord, the Lord is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love uh, to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. But he will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the father's iniquity on the children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. Flip over to Numbers chapter 14, verse 18. Here it says, the Lord is slow to anger, and abounding in faithful love, forgiving iniquity and rebellion. He will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children to the third and fourth generation. Both in the giving of the law multiple times, it talks about this idea, this character of God that is based on love, loving kindness, graciousness that brings about mercy. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 17. They refused to listen and did not remember your wonders you performed among them. They became stiff-necked and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love, and you did not abandon them. They're talking about when the people abandoned God, seeking their own rulers, God did not abandon them. Psalm 86, Psalm 86, verse 15. But you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth. Over a few pages to Psalm 103. Psalm 103 and verse 8. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. Psalm 145, getting near the end of the book of Psalms, and it repeats the same idea again. Psalm 145, verse 8, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, 
slow to anger and faithful and great and faithful love. The Lord is good to everyone. His compassion rests on all he has made. Jeremiah 9:24, Joel 2:13, Jonah 4:2, Micah 7:18 all say the same thing. All through scripture there's this kind of catchphrase of description for God that he is slow to anger, great in loving kindness, great in grace, and that he is great in faithful love. The reason I bring this up is this. I think the way that we often limit the concept of grace is that we speak of it as if it is an event in history, that God showed grace through Jesus on the cross. And that grace is there to bring about salvation, like what we read in Ephesians chapter 2. For you have been saved by grace through faith, and there's this idea that this act of grace that God gave and put upon mankind, it brought about salvation. But what I want to argue, based on Scripture, is that grace is something that God has done continually because it is God's character. It is God's attitude. It is the way God has chosen to feel about us. We have a God who is gracious. A God who displays grace often. It matters because if we understand grace not as an event or as a choice, or an act, or one thing that happened in history, but it is the nature of God himself that makes it the nature of God's salvation. We find that all these other passages that talk about salvation make a little more sense. Like Isaiah 53 and verse 10. Isaiah 53, in that famous passage of Scripture that describes Jesus as the suffering servant in prophetic language and that he's the one who takes our sin and he, he deals with our sins. It says there in verse 10, yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. Pleased. When you make him a guilt offering, he will see his seed, he will prolong his days, and by his hand the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. The Lord was pleased to see Jesus crushed. Well, that, that's a hard statement to deal with, isn't it? I, I can't think of any circumstance at all in which I would be pleased to see my children crushed. Whether we're talking physically or emotionally, if my children hurt, I hurt. If my children are, are, are in some way, unless I'm the one hurting them, then I'm laughing a little bit because it's just something we boys do. But it, you know, that, that's a different matter what's the, you know, completely. But this idea that the Lord was pleased to see him crushed, how? How can that be true? Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5. Over here it says, He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself according to the good pleasure of his will. And then down in verse 9, He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. You know, he's pleased, he, he, he's gratified by the fact that Jesus was crushed. Why? Because it was a display of his grace. It was a display of his character. God desired not that Jesus would suffer, but that Jesus would do the work that was necessary to bring together all things in heaven and on earth into God's will. Because that was what was best. Because that displayed his grace. Because it displayed the plan that he had put in place in order to bring about good things. This is why I think you have other passages like 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, which says, uh, don't be, you know, 
don't be worried about anything, but cast your anxieties on him. Why? Because that's a display of his grace. He's involved in our lives. He desires, because he is a God of grace, he desires he show, to, to show his favor on us. And the best thing I can relate it to is my very own children. I love to see my children happy. Doesn't mean I give them everything they want. But I, I love when things work out for them. I love to see them succeed. I love to see, thing, uh, see, see uh, everything happen the way it should happen, the way we plan for it to happen. And, and in doing all of that and seeing all of that, it, I, I have found through the years that I care more about my children's happiness than I do other children's happiness. Sorry, guys. I mean, I really do. It's been really hard for me as a, as a uh, budding camp director not to give my children everything they want. I've not. It'd be easy for me to. Oh, you want this society? Okay. Oh, you want this? I'll do that. Oh, you want this? I can do that. I would love to do that for my kids because I favor my kids. I have a desire to see my children, that things work out the way they want them to because I favor them. That is grace. That's the same concept. God desires to see things work out for us because he feels grace toward us. And so when it talks about God's grace through Scripture, what it's talking about is God's desire to see things work well. He desires for us to... Uh, to, to, to succeed. And we're going to talk tonight about stories, kind of go through the Bible story and talk about all these different ways in which God shows grace. But the reason God shows grace, and I'll give you just kind of a, the, tonight's conclusion this morning so that when you come back tonight, you'll know exactly where I'm going, is that grace is to lead to faith. And by faith, I mean trust. The more we see God interact with his creation and show them favor and show his goodness and show the ways in which he desires good things for us, the more we see that, the more that is revealed to us, the more we see his grace in action through history, the more we have a reason to trust that his grace extends toward us also. And that's why I think when you turn back to Ephesians chapter 2, that's really what's being dealt with in this passage. Drake already read it for us, but let's, let's look at it briefly. It says here, God, rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had toward us, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in trespasses. Now there, there's the problem. God who is rich in mercy and love, who desires to, to extend mercy to us, realizes we're in, we're in kind of a, between a rock and a hard place. We are stuck. Not much we can do about it. Then Paul says, you are saved by grace. You're saved by grace. You skip down to verse 8. For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not from works, so that no one can boast. The idea that is presented here, the reason grace and faith work together is this. God has displayed his grace over and over and over and over and over again through history. He has displayed the truth that he favors us, that he desires good things for us. 
that he wants things to work out for us, that he desires for us to be able to get away from our sin and get away from our guilt and have good things in our future. God wants what is best for us, the same way we want it for our children. And that should lead us to trust him. The more we see the grace the more we respond with faith. I think sometimes we've looked at this passage of Scripture, like Ephesians chapter 2, and we've create, we, we, we've a sent, in a sense approached it like a formula. Okay, God's grace, we do faith, that equals salvation. Right? I mean, and I, I probably put up little formulas like that for you before at some point. I know I have in the past. Here's where I think that fails. This isn't a transaction. It's a relationship. It's a relationship. And I don't know about you, but I, I had to learn through the years how much my parents wanted me to succeed. Because I believed it thoroughly when I was a kid. When I was little, oh yeah, mom and dad want good things for me, even though they punished me on occasion, which was a lot in my case. But it, you know, they, they, they wanted good things for me. I, I believed that as a kid. You know, when you turn up, you get a certain age, you stop believing that. You, for whatever reason, you start thinking, mom and dad don't want good for me because they're trying to prevent me from doing what I know is good for myself. Right? You kind of get to this, this idea that mom and dad are no longer on my side. And mom and dad have to spend the next several years reproving themselves to you. They have to make decisions and have conversations, and you have to see the way mom and dad's way of doing things might work out differently than the way you've decided to do things. And that mom and dad, you know, they want what's good. And the more you see that, the more you start building that trust back up, the more you start believing in them, the more it becomes easier for you to work with mom and dad, not work against mom and dad. You know the same is true in our relationship with God. God, and this is what we'll see tonight, has spent centuries proving to us that he is gracious, that he wants what is good for his creation. And it is not a transaction of grace plus faith equals salvation. It is a relationship of continual grace leads to trust which then leads us to salvation. The reason that leads to salvation is because now we're willing to trust that God's offer of salvation is real. It's true. It's available. It is something that, is, that, that you can have if you will just trust in Him. Brothers and sisters, if you don't believe it yet, you will tonight. He is a trustworthy God. If you're not a child of God, you can go ahead and become one today. This morning, we, we, will, we will study with you. We will talk with you. We will, we will sit down and, and, and work through the issues of life with you. We will show you the scriptures on which you can build your faith and a decision 